To open the year, Michael Spinks was stripped of the IBF Heavyweight Championship for refusing to fight mandatory challenger Tony TNT Tucker. Instead, Michael favored a more lucrative fight against Jerry Cooney later in the year. The move erased Spinks right out of the unification tournament, zapping the credibility that would have came with Spinks' lineal and ring recognition and bringing the championship to completion. Still, Spinks, the IBF, the tournament, and the division pressed on. The first defense for both champions and a golden opportunity for Bone Crusher to halt the rise of Iron Mike. Speaking of monikers, this was the first fight in which Tyson was announced with his iron tag. Of course, Smith failed to beat Mike, but he did go the distance, albeit at the hands of a boring hug fest. Tyson won a unanimous decision to become the new unified WBC, WBA heavyweight world champion and was a step away from securing his ticket in the unification finale against the IBF champion to be decided between Tony Tucker and James Buster Douglas. The largely forgotten George Foreman announced an unlikely return and was laughed at by everyone from fighters to reporters. He needed money to fund his youth center and had a real itch to fight Mike Tyson. Big George was a fitting moniker now, seeing as he'd ballooned to almost 300 pounds, though he'd trim a good deal off for his return on March 9th. It was eight days away from being 10 years to the day that Foreman was upset by Jimmy Young and had his spiritual awakening in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Remember that this was technically George's second comeback as he'd taken time away in 1975 following the Ali loss. No, the Foreman vs. Five Circus show doesn't count. George seemed to be a new man. Gone was the quiet, brooding monster. He was jolly, charismatic, and bald with a smile. Even his skin tone seemed lighter. Outward reflection of his inner rebirth, metaphorically speaking. Despite the new outer appearance, the cloud of Zaire still loomed above his head, and George was hell-bent on vanquishing it. The Steve Zowski fight did draw eyes mostly from the curious, but George's fourth-round stoppage win was mocked, and most insisted he stop before getting seriously hurt. George was dead serious, though, and continued to work toward the best version of his new self. The stamina issue was gone. The patience was there. The power was apparent. Old George wasn't done yet and had one goal in mind. Regain the heavyweight title, of which it seemed Mike Tyson would emerge from the heavyweight World Series with. Would he and Iron Mike get it on? And would it be a repeat of George's dominance over Joe Frazier? Time would tell. And meanwhile, both men had much work to do before any potential dream bout could materialize. Foreman in particular looking to prove that age was not a death sentence. The Golden Age was back for a brief showing with one of its brightest stars. The big return was on. Bounce Back Frank was back on the prowl after the Witherspoon loss and up against James Quick Tillis. It had been nearly a year since Tillis became the first man to take Mike Tyson the distance and he'd since retreated back into mediocrity. Bruno stopped Tillis in five, beginning yet another new campaign march toward the title. On the undercard of Tyson Thomas, Tony TNT Tucker and James Buster Douglas put on a hidden gem for the vacant IBF title. The winner would go on to face the winner of the night's WBC WBA main eventer later in the year to crown the long-awaited undisputed heavyweight champion. Douglas boxed well, so well that he had the lead by the time of the 10th. In said 10th, Tucker stopped Buster after a vicious flurry that followed a stunning right. It was over. Tony Tucker was the new IBF heavyweight champion of the world and on his way to the finale against the winner of the main event. What a finesse too, 
Tucker had seemingly come from nowhere to now be fighting in the finale of this historic tournament. The battle of the next big things was on. Thomas had lost his allure at the hands of Trevor Burbick, but there was still some draw here. Tyson was Tyson, and some had hoped Pinklin could bounce back. Instead, he was bounced between Tyson's left and right as he was dropped for the first and only time in his career en route to a sixth round technical knockout. Before his downfall, however, Thomas found brief success in using his exceptional jab and tying Tyson up in close quarters. Kid Dynamite was on his way to the ninth inning finale for the heavyweight unification crown. Hmm. We almost had Tyson Douglas three years before the fact. Oh, why am I drawing attention to that potential matchup? Well, because of the few near misses of it happening and, well, you'll find out in a timeline of the 1990s heavyweight boxing division. Initially billed as the heavyweight championship and shifted to the war at the shore, Michael Spinks' payday choice saw him welcome the challenge of Gentleman Jerry Cooney. Cooney had been mostly inactive since 1982, only fighting thrice since the super fight against Larry Holmes. Whether it was his 13 months away from the ring or not is up to you, but Jerry was handled by Spinks in five rounds, having been dropped twice by the champ in the fifth before the TKO. Cooney would fight only once more, three years later in the decade opener against fellow geezer George Foreman. Now, not only had Michael dethroned Larry, but he'd taken care of Larry's most notable opponent in virtually half the time. The Spinks Jinx was legit, and he had a more than competent claim to the heavyweight throne. The winner of the alphabet unification bout in two months' time would spark a legitimate question to his rule, echoing the events that transpired over 15 years earlier between the then-in-question candidates to the heavyweight throne. Alphabet champion Joe Frazier and lineal ring recognized champion Muhammad Ali. Unable to secure a cruiserweight title bout, Burt Cooper continued venturing to heavyweight and met Carl, the truth, Williams for the vacant USBA title. He was dropped in the first and refused to continue while in his corner after the seventh round. For Williams, this was the beginning of a strong turnaround after the losses to Holmes and Weaver. It would culminate in two years. Alpha Bet Unification at last. A seven fight, six million dollar tourney had unexpectedly ballooned to 10 fights and 22 million dollars. It had been nearly a decade since the major titles had been held by one man, that man being the patient zero of sorts for the lost generation, Leon Spinks, and his upset over the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali. The night was a golden opportunity for both undefeated young champions Tyson and Tucker and rightfully billed as the ultimate. Before we get into the fight, Tyson got into some trouble with the law on June 21st. He was accused of bear hugging a woman and demanding a kiss alongside striking her supervisor. He settled out of court for $105,000. A couple of weeks before the fight, Tyson was said to have skipped out on training camp to visit actress Robin Givens. There was also reports of discord amongst Team Tyson regarding the replacing of Kevin Rooney with Eddie Futch, but Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton denied these allegations. There was also controversy over whether this fight would be 12 or 15 rounds. The day before the fight, the three bodies met and settled on 12. Also, isn't it interesting that the finale of this tournament included none of the faces of the era from beforehand? No Weaver, Dokes, Page, Kutsia, not even Holmes or Spinks. It truly was the dawning of a new era. As for the bout, it was a very competitive 12 rounds 
that saw Tyson emerge with a unanimous decision to become the unified WBC, WBA, IBF heavyweight world champion. Tucker, despite a broken right hand, used his jab and comboed well in tandem with tying up Tyson to survive. His chin held up well when he was tagged. He put on a prototype sort of performance in answering Mike Tyson. Others would continue to build on what Tucker did on the night to shocking results down the line, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to that. This fight earned Tucker his Boxingpedia moniker, The Measuring Stick, a title he would continue showcasing against some of the best heavyweights in the following years. Tyson, to his own credit, adapted well to the tactics first shown by Tillis, Bone Crusher, and Thomas. He better utilized his own jab to open up further offensive opportunities and showcased a fine chin of his own, coupled with great patience against a hard-to-hit target. Both warriors put on a show and looked great in what was technically the finale of the Unification Series. But, oh, come on now, what about the lineage? Would we miss out on the full coming together of the title off the technicality that we'd already been given unification? Given the rap of the powers that be, it was to be expected. Tyson made it clear in the years after the affair that anyone who wanted a real shot at him would have to go through Tony Tucker first. The following night, Tyson was thrown a coronation ceremony by Don King to commemorate the 18-month journey of the HBO Heavyweight World Series. During the event, the heavyweight crown was bestowed upon Iron Mike by Muhammad Ali himself. If that wasn't the passing of the torch, I don't know what it is. And now we enter the extra innings of the Heavyweight World Series. See, despite the alphabet titles being brought together, the lineage and ring recognition were still out there, the lineage being the most prestigious and important of the splintered crown. Just two months later, undefeated unified alphabet champion Iron Mike Tyson welcomed a personal challenge from undefeated 1984 Super Heavyweight Olympic gold medalist Tyrell Biggs. Back in March on the undercard of Tyson Smith, Biggs beat David Bay, but suffered a cut that required 32 stitches. It cost him an earlier planned match with Tyson to either proceed or follow Tyson's bout with Pinklin Thomas. The beef between these two went back to the events surrounding the 84 Olympics. When Mike went to wish the team good luck, after failing to qualify himself, Biggs dissed him. A woman who'd come to also wish the team well included Tyson and said wishes, and Biggs didn't hesitate to correct her while laughing that Tyson certainly wasn't getting on the plane. Tyson never forgot, and also felt the gold should have been his in the super heavyweight division, but he was bumped down to heavyweight where Henry Tillman eliminated him from contention. Biggs also made sure to demean and taunt Tyson in the buildup, stating how he didn't see Tyson as the invincible champion only as the kid from back in the Olympic days. Mike must have heard it all too, because he played with his food like a madman on fight night and even admitted after how he really wanted to punish Biggs. Tyrell started well, using his jab and fighting the outside game plan, but Iron Mike bided his time and broke Biggs down, busting the challenger up en route to two knockdowns and the stoppage in the seventh. The first knockdown almost sent Biggs out of the ring, and the second sent him tumbling onto his butt into a corner where the action was immediately halted. Mike Tyson had retained the unified WBC, WBA, IBF title and could sleep all the better at night knowing he'd avenged the lost gold medal and shut Biggs' mouth. Big time. Or so we thought, as Biggs claimed he was still the superior fighter after the bout on the grounds, that Tyson couldn't beat him five times out of five. 
Believe what you will, I guess. Tyson had also set himself up for an encounter for the history books in January of the next year. The clash between the young lion and the old lion. The face of the division for the first half of the decade who really couldn't fight off the itch to return. As for Tyrell, you'll see him again in this timeline and even in the 90s timeline, but he'd fizzle into nothing more than an obstacle for rising stars. This wound up being the final ever scheduled 15 round heavyweight title bout. Frank Bruno scored an eighth round TKO over 70s contender Joe Bugner in his final fight before shooting for the heavyweight title again. Said bout would come over a year later in early 1989 due to outside delays. As for Bugner, this will be his last mention in this timeline, but as a reminder from the 70s timeline, his big moment would come in 1998 against Bone Crusher Smith when he finally captured a heavyweight title, the WBF title, at the age of 48. It was an obscure title, but damn it, he never gave up. Nineteen eighty seven was in the rear view, and these were Ring Magazine's heavyweight top ten. Kid Dynamite had accomplished something unthinkable for a man of his age unify the splintered alphabet titles. The first three belt unified heavyweight champ and widely considered the man by most fans, but there were still doubters in the name of the lineal champion Michael Spinks. Maybe they would settle the score in the coming nineteen eighty eight. Michael Spinks' fifth round TKO over Jerry Cooney takes home upset of the year. Spinks was an 8-5 underdog despite the erosion of Cooney since his loss to Larry Holmes five years earlier. A lot of good options on the year. Tucker Douglas, Tyson Thomas, and Spinks Cooney could take round of the year, but for my money, it's the finale of Tyson Biggs where Iron Mike squashed Terrell with two knockdowns after busting him up bad. Fight of the year goes to the undisputed alphabet affair between Iron Mike Tyson and Tony TNT Tucker, a competitive 12 rounder that showcased Kid Dynamite overcoming the sort of opponent that would trouble him down the line. Despite not receiving formal recognition, is it even a question that Mike Tyson is fighter of the year? He stepped up to the plate again, now unifying the alphabet titles for the first time since the Ali Spinks duology. The question loomed again, could he continue this streak of magic? Also, it's worth noting that Ring Magazine recognized Evander Holyfield as fighter of the year. He had a stellar year. He beat Henry Tillman, a gold medalist who'd beaten Mike Tyson twice in the amateurs, unified the WBA and IBF cruiserweight titles, beat notable Ozzy Ocasio, and knocked out Dwight Muhammad Kawi in four rounds in a rematch of their legendary first bout. Even inadvertently, the Tyson-Holyfield rivalry was building. On January 17th, Jose Ribalta stopped former champion Leon Spinks in one round. On August 30th, Frank Bruno scored a TKO win over Reggie Gross. On September 24th, Joe Bugner won a unanimous decision over Greg Page. On October 18th, Mike Tyson's punch out was released. Coupled with Tyson's unification feat, it was further testament to Tyson's arrival as the successor to Muhammad Ali. The game was a smash hit and has gone down as not only an all-time great video game, but also the best-selling boxing video game ever with 3 million cells. I gotta beat this game one of these days. George Foreman went 5-0 on the year, slowly but surely regaining form and proving himself. It was finished. Mike Tyson was the heavyweight champion of the world. Or was it Michael Spinks? The bottom line is that there were two legitimate heavyweight champions again. It may not have been by the circumstances in 1970, but history does rhyme when it doesn't directly repeat itself. 
Tyson and Spinks were the mirrors of Ollie and Frazier, and something, or somebody rather, had to give. 1988 was hopefully poised to answer the burning, eternal question. <laughs>